Today, I want to talk about genres. Genres, baby. Not just genres of fiction like mystery and sci-fi, but genres of non-fiction like different kinds of newspapers, scholarly prose, even political speeches. <laughs> genres are like rooms in a library. Each room has a particular kind of text in it, and each room tends to be frequented by a particular set of people. And we tend to develop and enforce ideas of the kinds of people who go into each room. To some extent, this is through overt gatekeeping, such as ideas of who is and isn't a sci-fi reader and who isn't a sci-fi author, uh, or who could or could not be a medical doctor, for that matter. But it's also managed through the contents of the genres, the words on the page, or, you know, the words you hear. Everything we write or say takes part in a definition of who we are and who the person we're speaking to or writing for is. There's always this idea of a social set. Sometimes it's an academic or professional in-group. Sometimes it's readers of a particular genre of text who always also have ideas about themselves as readers of this kind of sci-fi, this kind of newspaper, this kind of romance novel, this kind of academic analysis. All group definitions involve who's in and who's out, which means that they all involve ideas of relative status. The most basic status definitions, of course, are socioeconomic class, and we can and do define who we are, who we aren't, and who's not us by the spaces we have access to and the experiences we can and can't afford. How nice is your clothing? I bought these shoes in Barcelona. If I was real broke ass, I couldn't do that, you know? Um, what kind of car you have? I don't have a car. That's a real luxury because of where I live. What kind of house you have? I don't live in a house. I live in an apartment that is super nice. Um, how you can travel. This involves gatekeeping because people who aren't in aren't let in to the stuff that, that is available to people in a certain socioeconomic set. But there's a problem when it comes to using language for gatekeeping. Words are free. You can't keep anyone from acquiring vocabulary. There is no word that is just too expensive to use. There's technically no word that you're not rich enough to know and use, technically. So instead, we do two things. First, we have a sip of coffee. Actually, that's thing zero. We develop in-group ways of using words that require social experience to know. So teenagers do this all the time, of course, with all the latest popular slang that the youths like. I mean, of course they do, but so does everyone else. Words have cultural references, and words are known by the company they keep. And there are uses and turns of phrase that a dictionary just won't tell you. Um, you may be able to acquire that social signifier, but you need the right social connections to do that, to learn how to use it. So the, any, who of you um, has seen Six Degrees of Separation? Okay, there's the, a scene in it where this uh, kid who is definitely not from rich money is being told that, for instance, you don't call it a couch, you call it a sofa. And obviously he knows both words, but he didn't know that one is the word to use and one isn't. This is also how old money keeps out the nouveau riche. People who, they, two sets of people, both of whom have money, but one who is an arrivist and the other one who is the right sort, dear. Is, are you all able to hear me? Should I scream into the mic closer? Okay, good. Um, we also exclude certain words and certain ways of using words. Um, using certain words and certain kinds of words marks a person as not the right sort. <laughs> the most obvious example of this is swear words, I mean WTF. But <laughs> they're actually pointedly in fractions. They have their own special role to play. There's the well-placed vulga vulgarity, even 
even in high class groups. I remember a lady who was uh, as patrician as you can be in Canada. And um, one time I was, I mean, you can, but we don't have, we don't have actually, you know, technically nobility, but if we had, she would have been in. And I was showing her a uh, backpack. I had, and I said, it's good. And she says, yes, damn good. <laughs> okay, then. Um, but the way we do this, aside from the swear words, the way we do the filtering all the time and without even thinking twice about it is filtering out people who use incorrect conjugations, incorrect pronunciations, incorrect punctuation, incorrect spelling. Many of these details of the language have very little effect on clarity of communication. We know they do because they can easily tell you what you should have said or what you should have written. If it were a problem of clarity, they would have said, huh? <laughs> so they're available for use almost entirely as a social filter. And English, in particular, is so capricious and inconsistent that we have absolutely endless opportunities to do this. <laughs> and we all do it. Of course, it's usual for people to aspire to higher status if one is available. This drives a lot of genre style and development, which is what I'm going to be telling you about. But it also drives everyday usage. And an emblematic example of this is you versus non-you. Mm. Coffee versus non-coffee. In 1956, Nancy Mitford, a member of the British upper classes, actually, I think there's a lie I have to say, British upper classes, it's, wrote a book called Noblesse Oblige, in which, drawing on research by philologist Alan Ross, she looked at little things that people said and did that marked them to members of the upper class as either belonging or not belonging to the upper class. Things that people who weren't upper class wouldn't recognize as distinguishing. In other words, dog whistles is a term we like to use. And things that they might get exactly wrong in their attempts to seem more like upper class. Now, here's a copy of the sequel. I don't have a, the original for some reason in my library, but I have a copy of the sequel. Have a look at the cover here. Which one of these people is middle class and which one is upper class? So, you see that the fellow on the left has a houndstooth jacket and a paisley tie? Quite stylish. Probably expensive. You'll see that the fellow on the right has a boring striped tie and a loud jacket. Boring striped tie, just like this one. <laughs> you know where I got this tie? I got this at Strathcona Tweedsmere School a very expensive private school that I went to for exactly one year. And then my parents said, you know what, we're wasting money on this. <laughs> that tie that that guy on the right is wearing is likewise a school tie from one of the best schools in England. If you don't know which school it is, then you don't know. But if you do, you do. He's not dressed for looks. He's dressed for tradition. <laughs> the one on the right is signifying upper class upbringing. The one on the left is not. Tradition mattered quite a lot to the upper classes of the time, and frankly, I believe that is still more than a little true. Now, this book was published in 1978, um, so, you know, things have changed a little since then. Um, as you listen to uh, Prince Harry, for instance, he doesn't seem to be to stand on ceremony quite as much, but I'll show you just a few of the words that set you apart among those who know as you or non-you. So... Classy, smart, costly, expensive, dress suit, dinner jacket, expecting, she's expecting, she's pregnant, pardon, what, perspire, I'm perspiring, I'm sweating, oh, it was my raincoat, oh, I don't have, have you got my Macintosh, I've heard they're quite wealthy, oh, they're rich. To some extent, you see tradition. To some extent, you see habit. To some extent, you see a bluntness that is available to those who are in no way insecure about their social status. You don't need to be delicate and polysyllabic and say perspire and wealthy. You can just say sweat and rich because you're already there. Nobody's going to keep you out. 
Middle class affectation and insecurity prefers pardon, while security, secure status is perfectly fine with what? Now, to be fair, much of the book consists of discussions among cert several certified members of the upper class with, you know, all their genealogy trees and everything about what is and isn't upper class. So these aren't one striking you're out kinds of shibboleths. A member of the upper class might even use one or more of the gnawing you terms for some particular reason, and obviously the converse could also occur. But there is an accumulation of evidence over time that someone might not belong. And that's how it goes with these filtering status signifiers, as we'll see. Now, now, I'm not saying that some genres are more upper class than others. That would be a bit simplistic. I mean, I'm not not saying it, but <laughs> let's look at some of the ways choice of vocabulary can participate in the definition of the social set of the hearers or readers. Um, this is an actual photo I took, actually took on an actual beach of somebody I actually know. Uh, the first thing we might think of is using an unduly fancy word. Yo, dude, I'm sick. Like, I literally have E. coli induced gastroenteritis. <laughs> in some contexts, you can get away with it, but in some contexts, it's like wearing a tuxedo on a beach. And I mean, yes, he took off his jacket. Okay, fine. Tommy went to play with Sheila, but their mothers told them they couldn't play together, so they sat apart to problematize the socio-ethnic inequities that motivated their moms. <laughs> Sometimes it's a matter of using a word that has a special sense in context, one that might not be known or appreciated by people not in that context. For the average person, for instance, gut is a very informal and imprecise term. It's just a gut feeling. If you were trying to sound technical, your gut would tell you that gut is not a word to use in, say, a medical context. But in the world of medicine, it has a specific definition and is used regularly. Do you see this is a medical journal published by the, the company that does the British uh, Medical Journal. Gut, that's the name of the journal, gut. And you can filter yourself out by thinking it's bad or of course by using it the wrong way. But often it's just words that seem inappropriate, not misspellings or misusages, but words that run against particular unspoken ideologies. And I discovered a fascinating example of this in my research for my master's thesis. Now, the, the, uh, the example is not actually the title of the thesis, which is Relative Use of Phonus Themes in the Constitution and Development of Genres, <clears throat> but that is kind of academic ease. Um, in my master's thesis, I looked at a set of words that have a particularly expressive sound association not just imitative ones like thud and splat, you know, on a batapia, but also ones like glisten and glimmer that just have sound clusters, in that case, gla, that tend to be associated with a particular added expressive suggestion of some area of meaning. You can't say that glitter is, is on a batapia because literally light doesn't make sound. There's no reason for gla to be associated with light, and yet, Glisten, glimmer, gleam, glamps, glamps? Okay, glamorous, glimpse. All of that, it tends to be associated with light, but not invariably. I mean, there are various words that start with glow that don't have to do with light. So I looked at how, the, how often these words were used in different genres in big data sets from the US and the UK across three centuries. I compared their usage with other words that didn't have the same kind of sound expressive association. They didn't have these phonus themes, but they otherwise had similar meaning, length, and origin. Because we all know that some kinds of writing will have a lot more long technical words. So I controlled for that. So glow versus burn, glare versus shine, mash versus pulp, um, clump versus knot, and so forth. And I found some interesting differences between genres over time and also between the US and the UK. Um, let me point out a few things in this. It's probably not the easiest thing to read up there, but um, 200 years ago, British fiction used phonus thematic words, these, these particular words, more notice, noticeably more than American fiction did. 
Then it decreased, while the American fiction increased, and finally both increased some more. So. Um, magazines have increased. Newspapers have increased a lot. Political speeches have increased a fair bit just over the last century. And humanities articles, you see that really sad line diving down? That's the humanities articles. They have strikingly decreased in their use of this kind of expressive word. Now, I wanted to survey scientific literature, but it was problematic due to the limited semantic area and the specialized vocabulary. I just couldn't come up with proper control sets. Um, I also tried looking at some subgenres of fiction, but I just didn't have enough data to get usable results. When you're doing the big statistical things, a few percentage points will make the difference. This isn't something that's like, you know, 100 to 0 or even 50 to 0. This is a few percentage points, uh, which is how, you know, most science gives you these stunning results that make newspaper headlines somehow. Um, I'm going to look at these one at a time, but first I want to talk a bit about what's going on more broadly between the genres. I want to talk about the work of a scholar named Douglas Biber, whose massive statistical analyses of English usage in different genres are an absolute treasure. Douglas Biber, B-I-B-E-R, his work was very useful to me in my master's thesis. He, um, he analyzed a whole bunch of different grammatical features in a number of different genres over time, and he ran statistical regressions to find out which features tend to co-vary. That is to say, the more people use this feature, the more they tend to use this other feature in the same text, and the less they tend to use this other feature. So he found just a few clusters of variation, things that sort of travel together in a herd, like editors, um, <laughs> that accounted for most of the grammatical difference between genres. And looking at the facts of these clusters, he named them as different dimensions. There are two dimensions that are really important. Caffeine and alcohol. No. Um, <laughs> the first is involved versus informational. Involved communication is personally addressing and involving the reader or hearer. So it has more private verbs, that deletion, contractions, present tense verbs, second person pronouns, and fewer nouns, long words, and propositions. Sorry, prepositions. It also has fewer propositions. <laughs> um, a very involved sentence is something like, I think you'll like this. A very informational sentence is, there is a high probability of positive response by the reader to the information. Same content. You can see the difference. Oh, I hope you can see the difference. Um, <laughs> the second dimension that really matters is what Biber calls abstract versus non-abstract. It's entirely distinguished by a few features that abstract the text from any personal or immediate character. And non-abstract style is distinguished by not being like that. So abstract has more conjuncts, therefore, however, more passive voice, more past participles, more adverbial subordinators. An example of a very abstract sentence is, strikingly, however, fully understood communication was not facilitated. The opposite of that might be, nobody understood it. <laughs> Biber ranks several genres on these scales, and I pulled out just a few to show you what will probably not surprise you. These rankings don't show the distance between them. I couldn't really represent them because they're very clustered and then stretched out. Um, it's pretty evenly spaced on the involved versus informational scale for those ones that I'm listing, although some other genres, such as personal letters and conversations, are way on the involved end. Um, all of the published genres except romance fiction are at least slightly on the informational end of the spectrum. But the dividing line between relatively less or more abstract falls between biography and journalism. And official documents and academic prose are much farther towards abstract. And another genre, technical and engineering prose, is way down in the deep end of abstract. So what's going on here with relation to the whole social set and status thing that I'm here to tell you about? 
Well, obviously, there are a few different factors, but the one I want to focus on first, the one that keeps academic prose so far away from biographies, for instance, and the one I think accounts for a lot of the variation in my findings about phonest themes, those sound clusters, which we're about to come back to, is the ideology of objectivity. The ideology of objectivity is an underlying belief in the association between detachment and authority. It's a belief that humans are messy, subjective bags of feelings and that to achieve real, authoritative, reliable, unquestionable truth, you remove people. It's why information written for ordinary people can look like this text on the left, while information for scientists such as healthcare professionals tends to look like the text on the right. So, on the left we have, your condition has overall effects that can cause further problems to happen, and these will affect how your medical team manages it. Your healthcare team will need to include different specialists who will work together to make sure they see the whole picture. Your specific needs may change over time, and treatment requirements can differ quite a bit depending on your individual characteristics. But the doctor, when the doctor reads the guidelines, will read, clinical management is reflective of the complications that can occur secondary to the overall effects of the condition. A multidisciplinary approach is essential to ensure a holistic approach. Requirements may change over time, and phenotypic variability can be significant. So those mean the same thing. Now you might want to say, I mean, except one is addressed to the reader and the other one's addressed to the doctor. You might want to say doctors naturally use technical terms. And this is true, but more than a bit of the time, the difference between the words they use and the words they avoid is that the longer words and the more abstract phrasing sound more scientific. But they don't actually mean anything more or other. And we'll get back to that. The other issue is that the text for the doctor could be written more like this. The way you manage this condition needs to reflect the complications that occur secondary to the overall effects of the condition on the person. You will have to work with a multidisciplinary team to make sure you take a holistic view and approach. Any given person's requirements may change over time, and you may find significant differences depending on the person's phenotype. This still uses the particular technical jargon words, but it's directed more to the doctor in a more readable style, and in many contexts, it will be actively resisted or at least taken less seriously. I mean, of course, it's all a trick of mirrors. When you say a set of subjects, n equals 10, were studied in regard to the following criteria, you are describing the same thing as, I chose 10 subjects to study, and I asked them the following questions. Mm -hmm. But by leaving yourself out, you're pretending that this is timeless, unbiased, uninvolved, abstract truth. Handed down from, well, not God, obviously, because... Um, <laughs> and this is because feelings are bad. Feelings are messy. <clears throat> like my voice lately. Feelings are not objective. And the removal of feelings from things is not only possible, but desirable. And the way you do that is by removing the people. Hey, presto! So how does this relate to what I found out about genres and expressive words and social filtering? Let me show you. Hmm. Random coffee joke. Um, let's start with the fiction. What I found with Phonus themes largely matches what Biber found with his two dimensions. That is to say, the use of my expressive word set seems to go generally along with the more involved style and also with the less abstract style. The interesting thing is that while fiction now has a comparatively direct, involved, and expressive uh, way of wording things, it had a dip, as I pointed out, about a century ago in England, but in the US it rose from even lower. 200 years ago, fiction in America shied away from the most vivid words, but fiction in England didn't as much. Here are a couple of examples. <clears throat> the one on the right from The Coquette, which you all know, the one on the left from an obscure English novel. Um, <laughs> First of all, he asked Miss Lucas. I was so vexed to see him stand up with her. Vexed. But he, however, he did not admire her at all. Indeed, nobody can, you know. And he seemed quite struck with Jane as she was going down the dance. So he inquired who she was and got introduced and asked her for the two next. Versus, 
When we were summoned to dinner, a young gentleman in a clerical dress offered his hand and led me to a table furnished with an elegant and sumptuous repast, with more gallantry and address than commonly fall to the share of students. He sat opposite me at the table, and whenever I raised my eye, it caught his. <clears throat> the colonials were more insecure about the literature and had more to prove. The literate set in England were more generally of upper classes and were more secure at that time, and so they were less worried about using expressive words in terms of phrase. It's the you and non-you thing. But as a broader section of the population became literate, there was more aversion to risking seeming undignified. They were insecure in their status and trying to be upwardly mobile. So British writing of a century ago was about the same level of expressiveness on average as American writing. And we have all allowed ourselves to be more expressive over the course of the last century. No doubt in part because almost everybody's literate. So you got that? Expressiveness is undignified. I am the least dignified person in this room at the moment, <laughs> and probably most of the time. If you're not at great risk for being thought undignified, if your, social, if your social station has its assurances, if, for instance, you're the dude with the mic, then you aren't so insecure. But if you are in an in-between social status where you want to move higher and you are risk, at risk of sliding lower, it's important to be more guarded and less expressive. That's also a factor in why humanities articles have gotten more scared of certain kinds of expressiveness. I mean, there's more to it. Than that, of course, a lot of publishing in the humanities now is in journals, which have developed a particular set of styles due in part to the cruelty of the review process. Removing yourself can also be a defensive move to preempt the whips and scorns of reviewer number two. But also the academic climate is in general strongly tilted towards scientific, which is tilted towards the ideology of objectivity. It's also tilted towards long words derived from Latin and Greek because those have considerable cachet built up since the Renaissance. But even controlling for those, humanities articles generally shy away from the most expressive words. And I can tell you this is even more striking in the social sciences. I, I have degrees in both the humanities, the fine arts side of humanities, and the social sciences, specifically linguistics. Um, in linguistics, there are quite a few people who look down on social linguistics because it's soft and floppy and it's about people's feelings and impressions. It's not, you know, scientific. Never mind that it uses massive amounts of data to support its findings because it wants legitimacy. But somehow syntax diagrams and phonological rule sets are more scientific. They're like the puzzle section of a newspaper, but, you know, published in journals. Why? Because they remove the people. I mean, they don't actually remove the people. They're all drawn, drawn up by a single linguist sitting there at their desk drawing the thing with the data. But, of course, it just comes from the data, doesn't it? So they don't really remove the people. They hide the people. But now look at the Hansard, the record of the political speeches in the Parliament of the United Kingdom, and you'll see a converse ideology at play. If less expressive is more objective because more, less human, more expressive is more human. If less expressive is more educated and more elite, more expressive is less elite. And as the common people get the vote, it's important not to be too elite. But wait, there's more. Less fancy, less elite, less sophisticated, more common and down to earth is more honest. More expressive is seen as more honest. This is, this is a great fact you can use if you like conning people, I, I swear. Not that I would know. Um, it's a very well-known language ideology. Unsophisticated equals honest. That has been well in place for a very long time. Uh, when I was studying theater, there was there is a character that was called the Stage Yankee from plays of the late 1800s. The guy who was the honest, plain-talking guy was, you know, a farmer from Cattaraugus County, for instance, was a specific example that I remember quite well because Cattaraugus County is where, just incidentally, my mother's side of the family came from. Um, whereas even a century ago in the Hansard, in the political speeches in Britain, it was important to seem to be of high status. Now politicians want to see not just of the people, but honest. And it doesn't have to be what they say, 
Thank heavens for that. Um, it can come down to the plainness with which they say it. Um, certainly there are those among us who love fine oratory, but if you're a politician, it helps to sound like you care about and empathize with your constituents more than you care about sounding fancy. So um, in 1903, here's one from the Hansard that I found that seemed um, characteristic. It does not seem to have occurred to those, these distinguished officers that it was the duty of the senior officers to see that those under them were trained to understand and to perform those duties on active service which are the very objective of their existences as offers first period in the entire paragraph. <laughs> for if it was not for the certainty of war from time to time, there would be no necessity for an army at all. And if they themselves had been keen in all human probability, the young officers too would have been keen. So that was then. Now, well, 20 years ago, I do not think that I could speak in this debate without at least referring to speed cameras, which are hugely controversial, not least in Norfolk right at the moment. The most prominent recent case involves my constituent, Mrs. Jenny Mason. In January 2003, Mrs. Mason's 42-year-old son, Andrew, was killed in a head-on collision with a car that had been attempting unsafely to overtake a lorry on the A1066 in my constituency. Mr. Mason did not have a chance. He flashed his headlights twice. He braked hard and veered into the verge. Unfortunately, he crashed into the car. And this, too, is reasonably emblematic of what is in the Hansard now. I mean, they don't all involve car crashes, but they all involve some sorts of horrible happenings. <laughs> Part of this, of course, is that a century or two ago, your audience for speeches in Parliament was just your fellow members of Parliament, who, especially at the time, were in general very similar in education and social background. Whereas now, if you say something, if it's notable, or sometimes even if it's not, it might get played and replayed and reprinted all over the place. But it's also that what people expect has changed. Let's have a look at the newspapers to see that. Now, I don't have data from circa 1900 for the newspapers just because of the availability of corpora. There's a huge corpus of modern British newspapers and there's a wonderful corpus of old British newspapers and nobody made one that I can find from circa 1900. So... So disappointing. Um, that's why the line is straight. It's not that it just went crazy like that. Um, this all the soul, this line is for UK newspapers, since my available US corpus data was only from recent times. But you can see, by the way, the US newspapers are very similar to, the modern US are very similar to the UK. You can see that in this regard, by the way, in other regards. Hmm. Um, <laughs> But you can see that the newspapers are at the top of the ranks now and were at the bottom of the ranks 200 years ago. This has to do with who was expected to be reading them and what they were expecting to read and what they could consider appropriate. So, <clears throat> we have two things. The one on the left details a violent crime and the one on the right details politics, politics. <clears throat> On Sunday evening, as Mrs. Sherrard, wife of Mr. Thomas Sherrard, watchmaker Houndstitch, and her daughter were coming up Petticoat Lane, Whitchapel, they were stopped at the corner of Gravel Lane by three fellows who dragged them a short way up Cock Hill and robbed Mrs. Sherrard of a half a guinea, two shillings and a gold ring, and Miss Sherrard of four shillings and a gold hairwork locket. They behaved in a very indecent manner to Miss Sherrard. And on Mrs. Sherrard rebuking them, they attempted to serve her in the same manner, but were prevented by some persons coming up. <clears throat> The Tory truce over England began to crumble on Saturday as David Cameron faced an angry backlash from MPs over his attitude to his party in the referendum campaign. So, <laughs> you won't find crumble a backlash in the crime report. And all reportage of that time strove to be similarly erudite. I mean, obviously you had lots of time for sitting and reading, because they didn't have Twitter, um, <laughs> which is also sitting and reading. Um, it was following the idea that truth came from learning. Now, truth comes from not being too sophisticated. Mind you, newspapers also do follow the ideology of objectivity. They typically strive to erase the author of the article, and they also engage in rampant both sidesism, following the idea that if there are two views on an issue, objectivity requires that you give them equal weight even if one side is held by a small group of people or is contrary to known or established science or is really only one of several perspectives, the rest of which are ignored. Truth is objective. Objective is balanced. Balance requires two things getting equal weight. That is why my balance diet, after I finish this coffee, I'm going to have a beer. And that's the way it goes. <laughs> Remember that language ideologies are more concerned with the form than with the substance. That's why scientific words for body parts and functions 
are acceptable in contexts where some unscientific words are absolutely taboo. Um, feces, poo, for instance, to use a comparatively innocuous example. Ideas about words attached to specific words and specific sets of words and ideas about words are ideas about the people who use them. I feel like this is the single most important point I'm making here today. So I'm just going <laughs> to... Do you have words that you hate? Probably. We all have turns of phrase or infractions of grammar that set our teeth on edge. In my training as a linguist and my years as an editor, I've outgrown a lot of my crankiness, about that anyway. Um, but I still can't get around reflexively thinking certain things about people who use certain turns of phrase. I don't like it when I see between 30 to 50 people instead of from 30 to 50 people or between 30 and 50 people, for instance. Um, but I no longer do as I did about 20 years ago when I was first creating the style guide for the company that I worked at at the time where I create, characterized between two this way. This is not the sort of English you got a university degree to use. <laughs> Of course I was trying to be funny. I know that's weird, um, at least a little. But it's a real mask off moment, isn't it? Um, as it happens, someone else in the department, a pharmacist, a very nice and smart person, deleted the sentence. <laughs> and I realized that maybe it wasn't funny enough. <laughs> Over the years, I also observed more and more about the class filter I was using. The truth is that prepositions are hugely idiomatic. There's nothing in particular that says different from or is better or worse than different than or different to. And likewise, we can understand between 30 to 50. Of course we can. And for exactly that reason, because no detail of meaning is hanging on it, we can let it function fully and efficiently as a filter to say, who's not the right sort, dear? And consequently, we often react very strongly to infractions. Group filters license aggression. When you see someone break a group filtering rule, you feel aggression, but you tell yourself it's because you're offended at this damage to the English language. <laughs> the English language is fine. <laughs> it's just your dominance aggression instinct kicking in. A special kind of English that works two directions is everybody's favorite, business speak. Everybody hates business speak. At the end of the day, most of us are on board with disrupting business speak or even putting a hard stop on it. We'd see that as a win-win going forward, but except for some low-hanging fruit, we just can't leverage the buy-in to move the needle on it impactfully. It is what it is. So everybody hates business speak except for the people who use it, and actually probably some of them too, at least outside the business context. So why do people use it? Words are known by the company they keep. And these words keep the company of your company. How did business speak get a start in business? Well, many of them, many of these words use cogent images, metaphors that were fresh to start with but have gotten hackneyed through overuse. Others are just more efficient at delivering expressivity or imagery. Why say effective when you can say impactful? <laughs> Why just put something to use when you can leverage it. And a few of them just sound fancy. Don't you want to curate synergies? Hey, babe, let's go curate our synergies. Okay, so why did they get overused? Why don't people come up with something fresh? Okay, well, for one thing, not everyone is great at coming up with fresh ways of saying things. There's a, there's a funny anecdote of somebody who uh, was a friend of, of Noel Coward uh, saying to another of their friends, well, why don't you just come up with something witty? Noel does it all the time. Um, so we hear somebody else's bon mot, and of course we gladly reuse it. For another, people like in-group references. It's the same thing that makes running jokes popular. It's why Twitter humor is almost completely incomprehensible to people who aren't on Twitter. It's citationality. Whenever we use language, we are drawing on and referring to previous uses and users of the particular words and turns of phrase. We choose our words on the basis of who we think of as using them and what context they bring to mind. Citationality is an idea introduced by Judith Butler, and it accounts for a lot of the social filtering and in-group use of language. 
We reuse forms such as in-jokes for the same reason as teenagers use the latest slang. And that's for the same reason as business people like business speak. It's like the school tie. Who cares if it's ugly if it says you belong? Okay, but why do the rest of us hate business speak so much? Don't say it's bad English. It uses the same grammar and derivation principles as literary English. Don't say it's because they do awful things like verbing nouns. We all use verbs converted from nouns all the time and nouns converted from verbs and so on. No one objects to crank, wreck, target, broadcast, mind, flower, bloom, weed, matter, fume, bin, welcome, dread, hold, class, like, start, air, post, state, peeve, comment, process, fancy, rant, look. <clears throat> all of those are examples of verbing and or nouning. When you're incensed by incent, I'll incent him to do that, it's not because it's a back formation. Edit is a back formation. It actually is. Some of these are hackney cliches, but we don't usually get so irritated by hackney cliches that would be like flogging a dead horse. <laughs> no, it's because these words are used by people we don't respect at least in a role we don't expect, and they're used to create an in-group that thinks it's so smart when they're not smart at all. <laughs> not at all. How dare they? No one is more loathed than a poser or imposter, especially if you think they're trying to put themselves above you. It's one thing to resent medical jargon. You know they've earned the status that entitles them to use it. And it's one thing to roll your eyes at teenage slang. You may think it's dumb, but you know they're just kids. But business jargon that is obviously trying to be so clever, so forward thinking, so um, bleeding edge, <laughs> with that moneyed smugness and aggression that you can just picture on the people who use it, when they're clearly not all that. Oh, boy. <laughs> so what do we do about this? What do we? What should we? Us here. We here. We few. We precious few. <laughs> the first thing is to be aware of it when we do it and when others do it. Let's be clear, we can't stop language from being used as a social filter. As long as we have social groups that distinguish themselves from the rest of the population, we will always have filter language. And we can't make language ideology disappear because there's always ideology in everything. And honestly, some language ideologies are not bad. The idea that clear language is good is in fact an ideology. It's well-founded. It's an ideology. On the other hand, the idea that people who don't communicate clearly are inferior is also an ideology, and that's not well-founded. There are some people who are absolutely wonderful people that are very hard to understand. Um, some people just aren't good at wordsing, just as some people aren't good at cooking or math or painting. And I think it's very bad form to scorn people for something we make money from. I'm always amazed at editors who get angry at an author for making an easily fixed error. Do you want, not want the money you get for fixing it? <laughs> I mean, I understand if you're being paid by the page and you're spending a lot of time cleaning up silly crap instead of doing the important things like finishing it sooner. Um, <laughs> but if you want to scorn people for the very thing you rely on them for, just admit that you want to see them as inferior to you. Then step back and give your head a shake. But also be thankful for that anger because it's like a red signal light on your bat dashboard. It is a pretty reliable signal that you have attached an ideology to a point of usage, that you're using it as a social filter. I won't go so far as to say that all strong feelings we have about language are si signals of ideology, mainly because I don't have the data to prove that. But watch out for it, pause, and look at what's going on. What are you thinking about the person you see as using that language? And it's also not the case that all language ideologies are accompanied by strong feelings. You may simply accept the ideology of, a more, of, for instance, more complex syntax being a sign of more complex thought without ever getting worked up for it. You may, like one academic author I copy edited, feel that making the reader exert more effort is a sign of effectiveness. This is, I, I suggested, well, you know, you, this might make undue work for the reader, and the author said, I am happy to furrow the brow of the reader at times. <laughs> <laughs> and why make it unnecessarily easy to understand? <laughs> and then this, 
right? And then this becomes an excuse for using abstruse or in-group terminology that serves only to limit access without adding depth of meaning, let alone clarity. Scholars in the humanities, I know this, love using pet terms that have the shine of sophistication, but the boost they give is really the citational boost of belonging to an intellectual in-group, not actual advancement of insight. So I'm, now I've problematized that for you. Um, but there's no blazing emotional signal light that goes with this. It's often conveyed in very dry and heavy little lidded tones. For us to see what's going on, it's a matter of recognizing something important. When you use language, you're always doing something for some reason. No, wait, no, let me fix that. When you use language, you're always doing several things for several reasons. We're efficient that way. We like to load as many purposes onto a task as possible, but also that's just how language is. It's a social and citational act that aims to influence other people. Language is never just about feeding data like a machine. The idea that it is, that the denotative value of words is all that's going on, and if there's anything else, it's an imposition that can be ignored, that is a language ideology too, and it is just false. It's as false as can be, and it's pernicious. Every act of communication always participates in a definition of the utterer, the receiver or receivers, and their relationship. So, we have these different ways of, perform of asking for the same thing. I beg your pardon, but would you be so kind as to open the window? You might say that to a stranger in a coffee shop. Would you mind opening the window a little? For Could you please open the window? Which also varies according to tone. Hey, can you get the window there? Please open the window. Open the window. You, window, open now. <laughs> Denotatively, open the window is the most to the point, but in many contexts, it's rude because it presumes that the speaker has the status to command the hearer. That's why so many of our politeness forms use could. Of course, we're not really asking if they could. We wouldn't even bother asking if we didn't think they could. Um, some people will use the ideology of denotation disingenuously to excuse rudeness. I had a roommate who used to do this all the time. I'm just being bluntly honest. No, you're being a dick. It's not honest. It's denying an important part of what's going on in communication. It's quite the opposite of honest. Oh, by the way, incidentally, also in addition to, the idea that negative things are more true than positive things is also an ideology. It enfranchises people who hold that keeping it real means being rude, when in fact they're just using it to pretend they're not exercising social aggression, which they certainly are. It also flavors a lot of journalism, somehow the Real truth about someone is always the negative things. Sure, that's part of the complete truth, but positive things are often no less true. Like any ideology, it's simplistic. It saves mental energy. So, <clears throat> grand summation. This, by the way, is the long room at, at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. Um, all of photographs used are photographs that I have taken personally. And I had to wait a long time to get that one. Um, <laughs> When you're writing or editing, you're working within a certain genre. You always are. It has an expected structure. It has expected grammar. It has an expected vocabulary. And it has ideologies that govern all that. And people will approach it with their own ideologies, too. Look for what kinds of words and ways of phrasing things are encouraged and, perhaps even more to the point, what kinds are discouraged. Look for the things that just sound wrong that might sound just fine in a different genre. Never take it's obvious as an answer. Sure, we all know that a medical journal will not accept the use of the term poo instead of feces. <laughs> but why? Because poo is a word we use with children. Using it says that writer, reader, or both are thought of as either children or childlike, at least in that instance. To be a respectable scientist, you must avoid such things and you must use the proper Greek or Latin derived term. And why is that? And why is that? And why is that? And we end up at the idea that medical writing must seem detached and clinical. That is a heck of a term, clinical. Have you ever been to a clinic? It's full of people feeling things. <laughs> a lot of things. So why is clinical a synonym for dispassionate and uninvolved? And it comes back to this ideology, this white marble statuary idea of science, when actually it's full of people. 
And then having identified the effect and the ideology, you get to decide whether you actually want to produce and reinforce that ideology and to figure out what you can change if you want something different. If for instance, you want to change who's filtered in and who's filtered out. It may be that the only changes you can get away with are subtle, but sometimes subtle changes still make a difference. It is 10.51 a.m. and that is the end of my presentation and if you have questions, 